Well, hey friends, I'm here at the church working on the second half of Daniel, the background for our online resources. I hope this first half, chapters one through six, has been really enriching for you, that you've encountered more of God's heart. And you know, as we jump into the second half of Daniel, uh, I thought it would be important to give you a little more background than we normally than we normally do. There's just a lot of dense, mysterious material going on in Daniel 7 through 12 that, especially for us Western readers, 2,000 years removed from the context, it, it can be really daunting at times. Uh, and so I want to offer uh, two main things. One, just a quick look at, at what we call the apocalyptic genre, the style of writing that we find in Daniel 7 through 12. And then I want to offer three of the most common interpretations for reading Daniel. Uh, and all of this is filled out even more online, so definitely check that out and kind of skim through that as well. So first, what is apocalyptic genre? Apocalyptic, it comes from the Greek word apocalypsis, which just means revelation. It's something, something mysterious that is being revealed. So whereas the Old Testament prophets would typically have a message from God, they'd come to the people, they'd say, thus says the Lord, the apocalyptic prophet would see this really intense dream or vision that was filled with metaphor and symbol and and it was hard to understand and so they would have to first ask an angel or some other divine being what does this mean and in that interpretation that they're given that becomes the the revelation the apocalypsis uh, and so that that's a key feature of this kind of genre and you see this popping up uh, around this time period in Daniel and into the first centuries AD and really what they're they're meant to do is they're looking at political global realities and putting the heavenly significance behind them. Uh, one of the best modern day corollaries, we, we don't have this genre today, so it's kind of hard to, to get into it and figure out what are we talking about here? Um, but one of the best that, that I think comes close might be the political cartoon. Uh, so think about this, if you had an artist who drew a really vivid painting of a massive, I'm talking continent-sized elephant, right, gearing up for battle against an equally massive continent-sized donkey, okay, and they're about to do battle across the entire United States. Well, we, especially us in America, would instantly recognize that as a political cartoon. We would know that this is not saying that there was an actual gigantic animal battle, but we knew that somehow this artist is, is making a commentary on maybe the importance of the next election or the fierceness of the battle going on between the Republican and the Democratic Party, something like that. If this artist also added some demonic and divine forces aiding one side or the other, we could easily tell which side um, they were on and, and wh who they wanted to win, whatever battle was coming up. And so that, that might get you into the right mindset of what is an apocalyptic uh, literature. They're, they're looking at the world through this intense metaphor and symbol and ultimately coming to the conclusion God is in control he's orchestrating all of this and he's working through these world events in and for his people so that's a little bit on the genre uh, and there's three common interpretations that the book of Daniel has elicited from Christians there's there's many others but this is these are probably the three main ones the first one looks to an event in uh, a couple, about a century and a half before Jesus. Uh, there was a pagan king, Antiochus Epiphanes, who attacked Jerusalem and profaned the temple. He, he forced the Jews to commit these unclean practices, to sacrifice the wrong things on the altar, and completely just committed all this blasphemy. And they saw that, the people in that day saw a direct connection to Daniel. They thought Daniel was prophesying about them. And so in the midst of all of these kingdoms coming up, and there would be one pagan king who would commit this desolating sacrilege. That's from Daniel chapter 11. And you see that happening. Uh, this is the story of the Maccabees. In, in 1 Maccabees, this is where they get the, the story of Hanukkah today. Um, and there's some clear indication that the people of that day thought Daniel was talking about them. So there's one. Two is Jesus himself quotes from Daniel quite a bit. Uh, when he's standing before the high priest at his trial, he says that from now on, you will see the Son of Man seated on the clouds of heaven. 
And this was a reference uh, in Daniel. It's a metaphor of the Son of Man receiving kingship and power and dominion. Uh, and so Jesus is saying that in, in his death and resurrection, he's becoming king. And when he quotes that, that verse in Daniel, he's saying, I'm, I'm now headed to my throne. Right? It looks like he's dying, but it's, it's actually his victory. Uh, he also quotes uh, Daniel again to talk about the coming destruction of the temple. He's predicting that within a generation, the temple is going to be destroyed in Mark chapter 13. And he quotes from Daniel saying, uh, Daniel predicted this as well. And when you see some of these signs happening, get out of there. And we actually know from church history that the, the Christians believed Jesus. In 68 AD, many of the Christians fled Jerusalem and they survived the coming massacre. Rome was surrounding Jerusalem with its armies and pretty soon in AD 70 would completely decimate the city, destroy the temple, knock every stone down, and everyone in the city died. But the Christians survived because Jesus warned them a generation ahead ahead of time. Uh, when you see some of these signs, and he quotes from Daniel, get out of there. And they fled to the hills, and they survived. Uh, so that's the second one, Jesus using Daniel to talk about his own life, death, and resurrection, and to warn his followers about the destruction of the temple. And then a third uh, common approach to Daniel is to say that these, these apocalyptic visions are primarily about the future, and even the future from our own perspective today. Uh, they would say that, you know, while certainly there's some connection to those events in the past, and Jesus, especially Jesus' death and resurrection, uh, not enough of the symbols and visions in Daniel have been fulfilled. And so they're going to look at uh, chapter 7 through 12 and say, you know, primarily we're, we're still waiting for something to happen. Jesus inaugurated something in his life, his death, his resurrection. He is king of the world, but we're still waiting for that rule to be fully consummated. And that's, that's looking forward to Jesus' second coming. Jesus is going to come again as the earth's lord and king and master. He's going to judge evil and wickedness, and he's going to redeem and deliver the righteous. And we're still waiting for that day. And so many Christians have held all three of these uh, interpretation simultaneously. There's a lot to, there's a lot of merit with with each one. Um, but take a look at uh, at those. Wrestle with the text yourself as you're jumping into what, what what might this mean? What do these visions say about God? About God's people? About what He's been doing throughout world history? And ultimately, what does it say to me today? How can I apply this text to my life? So blessings, every everyone. I'm really excited to uh, continue in this journey with you.